Here in the Bay Area in Oakland, something that people see every day but may not necessarily feel comfortable talking about is the issue of homelessness. Um, and with that, we were super excited to invite Greg Klain, uh, artist, sculptor, and the founder of Homeless Homes to come speak. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, usually I save things that don't need much thinking for in the morning, so if I say something really off, call me on it. I might have meant uh, to say the exact opposite. I was given the theme taboo, and actually I had to look it up. It's a word originated in Polynesia, in Fiji, that means something uh, that society deems unacceptable. Um, so, you know, we could think of a lot of things that are unacceptable. Actually, they mentioned some, sex is the easiest one. Um, you know, other things just regional of what's acceptable here and maybe not another place. Um, you know, think if I came and I had a t-shirt with a Trump face on it. Probably be kind of taboo here, you know, maybe if I was in Indiana, it'd be okay. So just kind of these perceptions of societies, how we view things, what's acceptable, what isn't. Um, it's just an interesting thing to play with um, and something that I guess I play with a little bit. Now let's look at this, camping. We all like camping. There's probably some people here who's blocked some time off and bought a tent and planning to go to Yosemite and roast some marshmallows and get back to uh, nature and get out of our little zone. But then you look at this camping, you know? It's not quite the same thing. You really don't smell the marshmallows anymore. Maybe it's diesel fumes and urine and uh, dust. Um, so maybe this is taboo, maybe it isn't. What are the differences between those? This is the first photo that I took with my smartphone. To me, it wasn't really a phone, it was more a camera. It was my first camera. And uh, around me in West Oakland, I just started snapping photos of these homes, these dwellings that people created. It was kind of a weird mix that, you know, they're private spaces in our public space. And, you know, at first it was a little taboo to kind of peer in, uh, in someone's bedroom, someone's private space, and just start documenting um, where they lived. I guess a little bit about myself. I have an art degree, CCAC. It was CCAC when I went there, but they dropped the craft. And um, I was making sculpture, and then on the passing of my grandmother, I had a little bit of money, and I went in on partners and bought a condemned building in West Oakland and I started doing construction. And, you know, I was always handy with tools before, but I never built a house. So I started making, I, actually I made seven condos, and uh, I kind of got into the homes. I, li I like the functionality of homes as opposed to just a static piece of sculpture. Uh, but I kind of missed that creativeness, so I was kind of crawling back to the art side. I started making homes out of uh, shipping containers, out of dumpsters. And I think I was just looking around at, hey, what are some other things we can make homes out of? And the homeless kind of popped up to me. So I just go around and started documenting the people, the materials they were using, the locations they were using. You know, just started getting in their world, just started noticing, hey, you know, they do have landscaping. They do have, you know, all these aspects that we see in homes. I mean, I would just view this as, you know, a single family home, and here's your uh, car parked right next to it. I'd done a lot of traveling, Africa, Asia, to Europe. So I lived a lot in third world areas, so I was kind of privy to living, I don't know, in, in more primitive, I guess we call setting. So I just became intrigued at what they were able to do with what they had. And this was all illegally dumped garbage. I mean, obviously an old mattress created a lean to someone's inside. Uh, you know, again, their transportation on top, their livelihood. I mean, that's what they would go and mine, you know, cans and uh, build their livelihood out of. There's an old fence, you know, just cobbled together and you make a structure. Sometimes just cardboard. Sometimes it would get bigger. You got a nice little area, a little landscaping, barbecues. Just really utilizing these spaces, these kind of gray spaces that we have that are kind of public, kind of private, sidewalks under highways, little medians along streets. You know, meeting the people, hanging out with the people, seeing how they live, and then kind of really seeing them as a nomadic tribe. 
You know, we kind of cut all the trees down and killed all the animals and built this city. And, you know, it's a, the concrete jungle. And instead of dropping fruit and whatnot, you know, we're dropping garbage. And these people are taking that and they're, they're living uh, with that. And just seeing how they use architectural features. You know, here's a doorway. Here's a doorway with a little privacy. Here's a doorway with a little rain guard to slough off the water. Uh, using underpasses using that as a natural roof. You know, here's a place on the highway, you think, oh, I just thought it was an illegal dump. You get in a little closer, you're looking around. And then I notice, you know, right in here, there was a woman. Uh, you know, at first I thought it was a dump body. Then you kind of realize, no, she's still breathing. You know, then I see her again. Here she is under the plastic, and you kind of realize plastic is a good uh, barrier for you. It has that thin little membrane that keeps in heat, keeps the rain away, and, you know, we use plastic in our building techniques as well. And just kind of simplicity, some people just, you know, you have a cart, you sleep one place one night, and then move on. Um, just kind of noticing the different ways that homeless people were living. There's not just one way. And then kind of making the correlation between, you know, other tribes that we know around the world where we think, hey, there's these Eskimos that make a home out of snow and igloos, isn't that so great? And then just kind of seeing the correlations, all right, maybe here's a little tent. An igloo, or hey, how about a camper top? You know, we're kind of looking at these same things. Here's a home in southern Iraq, just woven reeds. Or, you know, here's a home, East Oakland, just all pallets. Here's a lean-to, Northern California natives. Here's another lean-to. Obviously doors and blankets and whatnot. Here's a little chill-out zone, Saudi Arabia to have tea. Here's another little chill-out zone, West Oakland, hang out. High Gothic art, well, maybe the same principles. You got the flying buttresses, and you know, just kind of seeing the homeless as ingenious and smart. And you know, this is at a time when people are kind of going on that whole green kick that, hey, I got solar panels, I got a Prius, I'm living green. And you're thinking, here, wait, you're not really living green. Here's people who are taking your garbage and turning it into the building blocks of their life. Either taking uh, everything we dump, making homes out of it, our cans, our bottles, they're returning in for money. The food that they eat comes from our discards. The clothes that they wear is what we throw away. Here's this, you know, if you look at Carbon Imprint, I mean, they're probably putting positive back into it. They're not taking anything. Then I started noticing little rooms. Here's a kitchen. Here's a little workstation. I don't know, startup. Anyone can start something up here for you know, a little uh, business. Toilet. You know, use a five-gallon bucket in some place. It's kind of the basics, homeless architecture. I mean, you got a pallet, you got a mattress, a couple of carts, piece of plywood, you throw a tarp over it. You know, so then these are people who are just kind of mining. They call it poaching, poaching cans, poaching things around just to, just to survive. Whatever has value uh, is what they're using. And when you're dealing with kind of our waste, eventually the garbage people come in. They kind of deem that you know, your home or your livelihood is taboo, and they come and scrape it up and throw it away, but leave the person on the street. You know, normally they give a little notice, tell the people to leave, and then throw everything away. It's one, you know, sometimes if it's big, they call in the big equipment and just kind of destroy everything. Here it is, it's kind of one of my spokeswomen. They target a place, they put up a little sign, and load it up, and the people are left to, you know, exit and go somewhere else. There's laws against stuff, but not people. So you could throw your stuff away, but you leave the people on the street. I'll give you a quick edited version of, of one person, Charles, of kind of that cycle. Uh, you know, you start with a home, they threw it away. You start it again with a mattress. You see the sign there. You know, public works department, it's uninhabitable, has to move. Um, you know, any problems, give a call. He come back, they threw everything away, except the mattress. There's three trucks to come when they clean out an encampment. One's for the general garbage, one's just for mattress, and one is for liquids. Kind of a hazard, hazardous waste. So, I mean, think about that. If we came back from work and your home was gone, everything was there, isn't there anymore, and you were left with nothing and you had to build a new home. Uh, well, that's what, you know, Charles does. He builds another home. They clean it out. He builds another home. They cleaned it out. Here's a different home. Clean that out. Here's another home. Clean that out. Here's another home. I mean, it's just a cycle that I would see, not just with him, and this is edited. I mean, there's a lot more with everyone. You just kind of see this. 
But you know, I was excited uh, about that. I kind of wanted in. I like the the immediacy of building a home. I like what they used. I liked how they used things. And I was kind of drawn to that. I think the creative side of me wanted, hey, I want in. I've made homes out of dumpsters. I've made homes out of containers. Can I make a home in one day for no money? That was my, uh, that was my little challenge. So I went out to illegally dump piles of garbage. I'd pull things out. You know, here's an old table I could use, some other pieces of wood. Dragged it back to my shop and came up. Here was my home in one day for no money, which actually took about a week and 50 bucks. Um, you know, the only things I really bought, I put it on wheels. I kind of put everything on wheels so I can move it around my, my studio in case I need to, you know, need the space. I already had screws and things like that, but, um, you know, it's pallets. It's built around a box spring mattress, pallet walls, refrigerator front door, camper top. I mean, I remember, you know, building this, I'd ran out of materials and I'd have to get in my truck, go around driving, looking for something else. I wasn't going to shop. I wasn't going to buy anything. You know, this sat in my studio maybe for four or five months. I didn't know what to do with it. I just wanted to build it. I slept in it a few nights with my kids, played around in it, and then I just started storing stuff in it. And then a rainy night, this woman, Sheila, who I documented many times, who had seen build, I don't know, probably 100 homes, she asked me for a tarp. She said, hey, the city came in, they cleaned me out. Do you have a tarp? It's going to rain tonight. I told her, hey, I don't have a tarp. Sorry, walk back in, walk past my home. And I thought, shit, what am I doing with this? This is stupid. Ran out and said, hey, Sheila, come back uh, tomorrow. I got a home for you. She kind of looked a little confused, like, no, I wanted a tarp. What do you mean? You know, just I said, no, come back tomorrow. So next day, this is one of Sheila's houses. Her and Oscar came back. I handed them the keys. I handed them a bottle of champagne. I said, hey, here's your home. Immediately, you know, they knew what it was. It was funny, because people would come over to my shop. They were always like, hey, what the hell is that? You know, what, what's that thing? I said, it's a home. No, it isn't. But, you know, they knew immediately, oh, wow, this is nice. So I watched them push it out. And then I watched them live out of it, and I kind of saw what a profound um, difference it made in their lives. Uh, to have solid walls, uh, to have a door that locks, to be up off the ground. I mean, you kind of don't realize when you're sleeping on the street, rats, there's a lot of rats. I'd see a lot of rat bites on people. To have a roof, uh, just to have a solid place that's yours and that you can come back to. And being on wheels, if the city said, hey, you have to move, well, you just push it. You know, instead of the city throwing it away, you just push it to the other side of the street. Kind of little cat and mouse game. So I was kind of hooked at that point. I mean, it, it's for me, it served that creative sense. I could build stuff. It didn't really cost me money. I was experimenting around. It was more like sculpture. I made something. In the end, it had a profound effect on someone's life. So, you know, I go back out to the garbage piles, picking out what I want, drag it home, make a rough frame, put some wheels on it, flip it over. A lot of times pallets for walls, whatever I got, just kind of let the materials dictate, finish it up, put a roof on it, have it done, give it away. You know, and I just, I just kept doing it, just kept playing around with ideas, with materials. You know, the windows are uh, shelves in, in refrigerators. There's a metal recycling place that recycles the refrigerator, but they don't recycle the glass. I'd take the glass, I'd make windows with it, old car parts. Uh, you know, this was an old jumpy. It's someone had thrown, you know, it's just all illegally dumped items. So I'd make, kind of make a run, maybe three, four homes, photograph them, and then give them away. Here's a woman, Wonder, who had been living, got the same location, maybe 15 years on the street. Gave her a home. Here she is, you know, now she decorates it. It's the first time she had a, a Christmas window, she said. She was happy because, you know, she kind of disemboweled a, a pillow or something to make the snow with the fruit and everything. You know, here's the inside of her home. Domino's was throwing away a bunch of those pizza bags to keep your pizza warm. Well, you know, they keep you warm too. And, uh, you know, I was just, for me, it's just experimenting with materials. What can they do? You don't have to buy insulation. What's the other stuff we could use? You know, they make insulation out of old jeans. Well, get some old jeans and throw them in there. Um, you know, let's use what society's throwing away. So yeah, I would just, you know, the different styles. I mean, here's a bunch of uh, coffee bags. Iron Man organic coffee must have been a you know coffee thing. They went out of business and they threw away a whole pallet of those those nice coffee bags that you put the beans in. You figure, hey, if I arrange them in a certain way, it shingles. Um, here's an old panel from a, a business that went out. A lot of the walls are pallets. Um, you know, a lot of futon frames they throw away. 
old windows. I mean, just, yeah, here I got, uh, I found a fish tank. So I thought, all right, I'm going to make a window out of a fish tank. You know, you think, hey, that's maybe something only for Jay-Z or, you know, some rich guy is going to make a wall out of a fish tank. But no, I'm going to give that to Johnny. So I put fish in it, <laughs> filled it up. Ironically, a fire started in his house. Broke the fish tank. Fish tank released 30 gallons of water and put the fire out. Some damage, but he rebuilt it. Still using it. He likes to paint. So, you know, every time I go by, I call him, his name is Johnny. I call him Jasper Johnny. He paints a lot of flags on the side. I mean, here's his home. Here's his little creative outlet. Here's something that he can call his own. Here's another one. I just, you know, I found a big, remember the old satellite dishes you see maybe in the 80s? Toys for big boys. I found that. You know, I thought, hey, I'm going to make a roof out of it. You know, that's what I started. That was the um, impetus for that. You know, it was a small home, so I had to go around and find a small person for it. You know, so I found Ron. I was looking at size of people. So she was the smallest I found, so that was her home. Just other homes, playing around, you know, with whatever I find. Little clocks in front, and that clock worked for a while. Another home, using old washer, uh, you know, machine doors for windows. Again, there's the Iron Man, um, Coffee bags, you know, I had so many of them, and those worked out really well. Usually in selecting, I mean, when I started giving them away, maybe in 2000, 2010, 2011, I knew a lot of the homeless around me, just proximity. You know, now there's a lot more homeless, uh, but I would kind of see how they were living. People who usually been on the street for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, kind of, lack of a better term, I call them lifers. You know, they're out there really entrenched. Um, and, you know, I catered a little bit more towards women than men. They're a little lot more victimized on the street. Um, but, you know, I just wanted someone who would take the home, take care of it, you know, let them know, hey, this is a gift, this is yours, do what you want with it, don't sell it. Uh, you know, if your situation changes, you no longer need the home, you gotta give it to someone who does. I gave this one to Greg. Actually, the front part is the one I made, so he made it a double wide, he added on to it expanded it um, so we kind of have a little back and forth of who, who can make a better home and who can improve it um, more. Here he is in front, you know, we hang out, barbecue in front of it sometimes. This one, you know, I've been in L.A. doing some, some workshops and this is one of those from L.A. There's one in San Francisco giving away a few. And it's interesting because the guy who's living in it at this point is maybe the third owner. I've had some who've had like maybe five, six, seven different people living in it, uh, different locations. Here's one. I made a Victorian. This was kind of a little bit more extensive. I kind of found, I found a big, this is a sonic tube, which they use to cast concrete for big piers. And I was just going to make one that lies down, but I thought, no, let me make, you know, I want to make a turret. So, um, yeah, made a pretty big extensive one. And I, it was interesting because San Francisco, I kind of had to see the landscape there. It was the homeless landscape. How do they live? Uh, is there locations to put homes? You know, Oakland has a little bit more space, a little bit more dead ends, and um, lots that you could park at where San Francisco is a little bit more dense. Um, so, you know, you just got to feel, feel things out and see how it goes. And also, if something happens to it, I can't be too beholden to it. I mean, you know, I've had homes stolen. I've had homes sold, uh, you know, for, for crack. And you see it in the back of the dealer's yard with a couple of pit bulls living in it. Uh, some have burned, some the city have destroyed. And, you know, it's what happens, happens. And that's kind of, you know, the way I look at it. Some people who've worked with me on the homes get a little coveted about them. And if something happens, it's, you know, affects them a lot. And it's like, hey, you, you can't hold on to it like that, you know? Just keeping this gift economy. Um, different people, Maestro. Actually, he, I mean, you know, this... I approached this whole thing about making homes. Uh, that was my stint on, on doing this. I wasn't an advocate for homeless, per se. You know, people think, oh, you're such, you work with the homeless. It's like, well, I didn't, I didn't start out that way. I didn't want to become the spokesman for homeless people or whatnot. I wanted to make some crazy homes. That's all I wanted to do. And I was inspired by the homeless, and I just kind of ripped a page out of their book using the same materials. Uh, you know, I just had tools in a shop so I could bring it back and put it together in a little bit more permanent way. And this guy, who he was in a bad car accident and his legs like all metal, they, they wanted to amputate it. He didn't want to, to do that. Now he just got gangrene, they were gonna amputate his leg, and now he was living in my home for a while and now he just got an apartment. It's kinda, I know a couple homeless people who've been living in my homes. One had a heart attack and all of a sudden, he, now he has an apartment. And he's like, well, that's the best thing that happened. You know, you gotta get a heart attack or chop a leg off and then I get a place to stay, which is, uh, ironic. 
Been playing around. Um, you know, we made one that looks like a caboose. Bright colors. When I bring different people in, I started doing it just on my own, and it was just my little kick, and, and I could control everything now that I sometimes open it up for, for workshops and other people. You know, different people come in, different people's ideas, different people's, you know, color palette and stuff like that, uh, which is nice, uh, but isn't always the way I would do it. Maybe here you can just see materials. Here's a piece from a, a heavy machinery. Here's a part of a chair. Here's a part of a, a bed. And just, you know, using these things as the building blocks. Here's a couple of young ladies who we built, and then they painted. You know, it was kind of cool. At first, they were just blobbing paint on. I didn't know what they were doing. But then it came out, you know, this really cool map of the world. And look, and I didn't even plan it. Look at how he matches it perfectly. I don't know, he just came by. But uh, now Larry, Larry has that home. You know, someone on their iPad, just hanging out, doing, doing work. I mean, it's, it's funny how, how similar. I mean, obviously, they're just people, you know, and, but we don't really see the homeless as people. I mean, when's the last time you walked up to the homeless person and said hi? You know, normally we see them, we kind of look the other way and walk, think, hey, I don't want to interact with that but you know the they're just like us and uh you know for whatever reason has fallen between the cracks and the safety nets and are now now on the street there's a workshop east oakland people coming together open it up i get a lot of wide range of people coming out i mean sometimes it's homeless advocacies uh church groups occupy people um you know, sometimes people just want to learn how to build a, a tiny home. Some people, you know, they buy a lot of tools and they don't have a reason to use them. Here's a time to use them. They, maybe they don't know how to build. Here's a good time to, to learn how to build. Mess up on someone else's houses before you do your own. Here is Peralta, kind of Oakland, Emeryville. And what they've done is put up cement barriers, told the homeless you could stay within them. We're going to give you porta potties, which is big, and garbage service. So it kind of legitimizes them. You know, here's a Syrian refugee camp. Kind of about the same. You can kind of see how homeless are refugees. Here's Burning Man. <laughs> kind of the same, not quite, you know. You just look at all these differences of, you know, here's people having a great time, paying a lot of money, hanging out, partying, doing drugs, music. You know, then you have another that's a refugee camp. You have another that, hey, it's not, it's their life. It's where they are. Um, but, you know, kind of breaks it down, the similarities of everything. It's a home I made a long time ago, and now the city gave them a porta potty and hand sanitizer. And, you know, that's big. I mean, people say, hey, I don't want homeless living next to me. I don't want them sleeping next to me. It's like, you don't have to worry about where they sleep. Where are they relieving themselves? You know, I mean, this is just a biological necessity. What if we were here and there was no bathroom? You know? Well, how are you guys going to be around noon? You know, everyone's going to be kind of itching to do something, go somewhere. Um, you know, we're just not affording people kind of the dignity and just the basic common um, um, necessities of life. You know, we're making them taboo, that oh, maybe you don't deserve that. You need to get it on your own or go somewhere else. I mean, it's easy for us. I mean, I, I don't see any homeless out here, really. I mean, maybe there is, but you know, we could all just walk into Starbucks or, or a restaurant or something and use the restroom, even if we buy a coffee or not. When you're homeless, it's a whole different scene. I mean, you think of, of racism, but when you think how homeless are treated, you know, that's, a whole different level of, of how society sees you. You know, you think of dogs. What infrastructure do we have for dogs in this society? How many doggy daycares? How many uh, dog walkers? How many pet stores? You know, I think, I don't know exact statistics. They say, you know, maybe there's 8,000 homeless people at night sleeping out there. What if there was 8,000 puppy dogs? What do you think would happen? Sure, people, oh, go adopt them, and let's get them a sweater, and let's feed them some organic food, and let me bring them home and get them spayed and neutered. And... But a homeless person, you don't do that. There was a, a dog hotel right by a lot of my homes, and in the morning, people were just lined up to drop their dog off, sign it up for a package of, you know, you can get a spa treatment, you can get personalized care and walking and chew toys and, you know, whatever else. It was between 40 and 100 bucks a day. Right behind them, there's people, you know? There's 50 people living in houses, and you don't really look at those. You know, for me, probably the biggest thing is just is knowing the people, meeting the people. I wasn't scared of homeless. I mean, they're around me, but sometimes you don't want to deal with them. Sometimes you don't look at them. It's something that maybe reflects on our society that's taboo, that you don't really want to focus on that, that that's an existence. I mean, 
you know, we see it. I'm sure everyone who came here probably walked by a few homeless people. But, you know, once you get to know them, um, hey, you know, they're just people. And in my experience, a lot more real than most people I know. A lot of my friends with normal jobs, normal homes, kind of hold stuff back. They don't tell you how they're really feeling. They don't really lay it on the line. But, you know, with people who are kind of living on the edge, you know, they don't, they don't hold anything back. They get a lot more philosophical view of the world. They don't just bitch about the weather and the traffic. Uh, you know, they talk about uh, bigger issues. Um, so that's it. I mean, I've probably, I'm between like 60 and 70 homes made and given away now. Oakland, West Oakland, East Oakland, San Francisco, Los Angeles. There's, now there's a lot more people doing it. It's kind of become a little movement, which is nice. Germany is a lot. Bulgaria, Venezuela. Um, other parts of California, Washington, uh, New York. Um, you know, people just coming together and saying, hey, I can, I can throw this together. I mean, it's not rocket science. I mean, it's, some people said, hey, that's just a glorified doghouse. And yeah, it is. Uh, you know, it's not the answer for homeless. It's not, uh, you know, it's not the magic bullet that's going to stop it all. Uh, you know, it was just my little exploration of, of what a home is and what it could be. And, um, you know, just seeing the impact uh, that it's had is, has been nice. Not everyone likes them. It legitimizes the homeless, gives them a place. A um, little story in San Francisco, the police were raiding a whole encampment, and they were just cutting into tents and looking at everything. Then they came to one of my homes, and they had to go get a search warrant because it was a door that had a lock on it. And then now that was a different characteristic than just a tent. Uh, thanks uh, so much, Greg, for joining us today. Yep, yep. thank you. Uh -huh. I appreciate it. <laughs>